You know people who run around all the time, I want justice, I want justice, I want justice. I want people to get what they deserve, but they sure don't want it for themselves. And I know, I'll be the first one to say, I do not want God to treat me with justice. I don't want God giving me what I deserve. I want grace. That's what mercy is. Mercy is not giving people what they deserve. You probably are very familiar with the movie and the book on which the movie is based, The Wizard of Oz. Now, if you're as old as I am, you remember when the only time you could see The Wizard of Oz, no DVDs, no DVRs, it was tele telecast one time a year on a Sunday night close to Easter. And if you were like me and had to come to Sunday night church, you remember what happened. You'd watch 20 minutes of the movie when you heard the words, turn off that TV, it's time to get in the car and go to church. I was an adult before I even knew there was a part of the movie that was in color. I thought it was all in black and white uh, during that time. But if you're familiar with the story, you know it's about Dorothy and her dog Toto and her three new friends, the cowardly lion, the scarecrow, and the tin man, and they're all prancing down the yellow brick road on the way to meet the wizard. And they each have their own request of what they're going to ask the wizard for. The cowardly lion wants courage. But the scarecrow said, I shall ask for brains instead of a heart, for a fool would not know what to do with a heart if he had one. But the tin man had a different perspective. He said, I shall take the heart, for brains do not make one happy, and happiness is the best thing in the world. Is that true? Is happiness really the best thing in the world? Yes. As long as you understand happiness the way Jesus understood it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5 as we look at some straight talk from the Savior about our happiness. We are now beginning the verses that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And in this first and foundational message that Jesus ever preached, he addresses 10 topics and shows how his way of dealing with these topics offers both genuine joy in this life and unending happiness in the next life. And like any good teacher or preacher, Jesus begins with the benefits. He says to his audience, this is what you're going to get out of living according to my message today. He front loads the benefits, always a smart thing to do. And over and over again in these verses, he's going to see, say, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted for their faith. Blessed, blessed, blessed. And that's what we're going to look at. This, these verses that we often call the Beatitudes are really a summary of Jesus' entire teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, uh, we need to understand what Jesus means when he says blessed. The word blessed is a translation of the Greek word makarios. And makarios literally can be defined as happy. Happy are those who are poor in spirit. Happy are those who are persecuted. Now, happiness is an acceptable translation, but it's not a complete translation. Because frankly, our English word happiness doesn't capture everything Jesus had in mind. Our English word happiness comes from an old English word, hap, which means luck or circumstance. I define it this way, happiness depends upon our happenings. I mean, happiness is a superficial emotion, and it is completely tied to our surrounding environment. It can come as easily as it can leave. For example, I enjoy in the evening sitting on the couch with Amy, eating my bowl of ice cream, watching a favorite TV program. I am happy. but. If my carton of ice cream is empty, 
If Amy is on the cell phone talking to somebody else and the internet connection goes down and I can't watch my program, I'm very unhappy. You didn't know you had such a shallow preacher, did you? <laughs> my happiness depends upon my happenings, what's going on around me. Jesus is talking about something more than that. He's talking about an inward joy, not a giddiness, but an inward assurance that comes from following God. In fact, this word makarios in Greek means to enjoy a place of special privilege. A believer who obeys Christ can be joyful, if not giddy, over the fact that he knows he is approved by God. And Jesus is saying, happy, blessed, Joyful are those who know they are approved by God. As Dallas Willard notes, Jesus takes the eight characteristics of people in this world that are the least likely to be thought to be in a place of privilege and shows how they are actually in a better place of privilege than those who are not in this situation. Uh, let's over, have an overview of these blessed attitudes. This entire Sermon on the Mount, remember, is a constitution for how Christians are to live both now and in the future. One of the things I wrestled with as I prepared the message this week is, okay, is Jesus talking about life now or life after we die? Which is it? And the answer is both. In fact, if I were going to summarize the Beatitudes we're going to look at, which is, in fact, a summary of the entire Sermon on the Mount, it's this. Write down this theme that I have on your outline. Those who model their attitudes, actions, and affections after Jesus Christ will experience a genuine joy in this life and unending happiness in the next life. There is a coming kingdom of God, the millennium, when everybody will live according to these principles, enjoy the benefits of doing so. But right now, the kingdom of God is within us. If you're a believer, you have the ability right now to submit to the kingdom rule of Jesus Christ. And when you submit to him in the areas we're about to talk about, you're going to experience a genuine joy not a superficial giddiness, but a genuine joy in this life and unending happiness in the next life. Now, I want you to notice each of what we call the B attitudes. Eight, each of these eight are a paradox. Uh, they, uh, as G.K. Chesterton said, a paradox is truth standing on her head to get our attention. In fact, Jesus takes our expectations and turns them upside down about who is really blessed and approved by God. Let's look at these eight paradoxes. First of all, he begins by talking about the riches of poverty. Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, he doesn't say blessed are the poor. There's nothing about having no money that makes you happy. You're not righteous if you have no money. That's not what he's saying. I know poor people who are miserable and poor people who are happy. The same about rich people. Has nothing to do with how much money you have or don't have. He's not talking about material possessions. He is talking about the poor in spirit. That Greek word poor means to cower, to cringe, to crouch like a beggar. When he talks about poor in spirit, he's talking about Joyful are those who realize their spiritual bankruptcy, that they are lacking in spirituality. We have to begin there. In Isaiah 64, 6, Isaiah says, the best we can do, our righteousness is like a filthy rag to God. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 3, 10 and 23, for there is none righteous among us, no, not even one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The beginning place for experiencing God's blessings is to understand your spiritual bankruptcy. One commentator translated it this way, blessed are the spiritual zeros. Do you ever feel like a spiritual zero? You feel like you're unworthy of God's blessing in your life? I'm not going to repeat 
preach my message, but remember from Luke 18, the story of the two men who went up to the temple to pray. The first one was the Pharisee, and his prayer, so to speak, was just a self-congratulatory speech reminding God of how lucky God was to be in his presence. But the publican, the tax collector, all he could utter were those seven words, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner, the chief sinner. Realizing your spiritual poverty is the beginning place of blessing. Secondly, he talks about the paradox of mourning, the comfort of mourning. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That Greek word translated mourn, pentheo, means to feel anguish over a distressing situation. Now, when we think about mourning, we think in relationship to losing a loved one through death. Some of our members even this last week have experienced a heartbreak that comes from knowing you're never going to see that loved one again on this side of the grave. There, there is a distress that comes from that. Perhaps the only thing more distressful than uh, separation by death is separation from defection, for somebody to willingly separate themselves from you, to say that they no longer care for you, they no longer love you. That produces a, an emotional kind of death and separation. We understand that concept of mourning. And the Bible says, you shall be comforted one day, and that's true. But when we read this in context, this is building on the last beatitude, the poor in spirit. He's talking about those who are so spiritually bankrupt, they mourn over their condition. We understand that when we look at Peter. Remember, after promising the Lord, he would not deny him. In the space of a couple of hours, Peter denied the Lord three different times. And when he realized what had happened, Luke twenty two sixty two 62 says, Peter went out and he wept bitterly. I think about the Apostle Paul in Romans seven twenty four, who talking about his own sinful condition, even though he was a believer, said, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of sin? Have you ever done something that was so horrendous that it even surprised you that you could do such a thing. You mourn over your situation. He said, you shall be comforted. There is a way to be comforted now, not just in heaven, when you're mourning over your sin. It starts with asking for God's forgiveness by trusting in Christ as your Savior. You know, there are two kinds of sorrow for sin. 2 Corinthians 7 says there's a sorrow that just leads nowhere except to death. If you're just constantly wallowing in self-pity over your unrighteousness, that leads nowhere. But Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7.10, the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation. Psalm 32, David talked about, he knew firsthand uh, the comfort that comes from confessing your sins and receiving God's forgiveness. In Psalm 32, he said, how blessed, how happy is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. There is no relief that can match the relief of knowing your sins have been forgiven that God no longer imputes them. He no longer holds them against you. How blessed is that person? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then in verse 5, Jesus talks about the strength of meekness. Remember, this is a paradox, the strength of meekness. Theodore Roosevelt once described William McKinley as a man who possessed no more backbone than a chocolate eclair. You know, our way of thinking is weakness is nothing to be admired. And we equate meekness with weakness. They rhyme. Who wants to be weak? I mean, our society frowns on that. We don't like anything that's weak or tepid. Who likes a tepid cup of coffee? Or on a hot summer day, a tepid 
tepid Diet Coke. You want things hot or cold. You don't want them tepid. We think of meekness as people who are doormats, pushovers, but that's not what the word meek means. In classical Greek, the word translated meek means power under control. It actually was used in classical Greek to refer to a powerful animal that had been broken, that had been harnessed, meekness under control. When I think about that, I think about the movie King Kong. Remember when King Kong finally meets the love of his life? Originally, it was Fay Ray, but then it became Naomi Watts, and he's holding Naomi, Naomi Watts in the palm of his hand, and he takes his big gorilla finger, and he strokes her hair <laughs> with his finger. I mean, that is power under control. He could squash her like a gnat, but he doesn't. He strokes her hair gently. Jesus said, blessed are those who harness their own power for other people. You know, happy is that employer who, although he's disappointed and upset with that negligent employee, he restrains himself. He doesn't pour out his wrath. Happy is the parent who, disappointed in the behavior of a child, doesn't give full vent to his rage or her rage, but instead keeps it under control. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. That's an interesting verse because Throughout the Scripture, the ultimate destiny of the righteous is inheriting the earth. Psalm 37, 11, uh, they shall inherit the earth. The humble will inherit the earth and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Our final destination as believers is not up there floating around someplace on some other planet. It's right here on this earth, this recreated earth. God made us for this earth. And this will be our ultimate inheritance. Blessed are those who are gentle, for they shall inherit the earth, Jesus said. And then in verse 6, he talks about a fourth paradox, the fullness of hunger. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Remember, we said your appetite is a good indication of your health. If you hunger, you have a hunger, that means you're probably healthy, even though you may not be satisfied. Jesus is saying joyful, happy are those who have an appetite for righteousness. What do we mean? Well, you've said before, righteousness can refer to judicial righteousness, our right standing for God, our need for God's forgiveness. And uh, if we have a hunger for that, if we want to be right for God, that, we're only seven words away from that. Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. A person who places his trust in Christ can immediately be declared righteous. Sometimes, though, that word righteousness refers to a right acting before God, obedience. And again, 2 Peter 3 says, if you're a Christian, you have everything you need to obey God and experience the benefits thereof. But I think there's a third sense of righteousness that Jesus has in mind here. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger to live in a world that is characterized by righteousness. Now, the term social justice has become radioactive in society now because of all the political baggage that is attached to it. And those who are crying loudest for social justice in many ways are headed in the opposite direction. They think you can have social justice, a utopia, if you just cast off the restraints of God's Word and embrace ungodly, unbiblical ideas. That's not the way to freedom. That's the way to bondage slavery. So we need to understand what's going on with the social justice movement. But let's strip that aside for a moment. Wouldn't you like to live in a world that's characterized by justice? Don't you want to live in a world where you don't have to lock your doors at night? Don't you want to live in a world where there's no more war or terrorist activities? Wouldn't you like to live in a world where good always not sometimes, always triumphs over evil. A world in which 
good things no longer happen to bad people and bad things no longer happen to good people. We all have a hunger to live in that kind of world. We crave justice because we're made in the image of God, who is a God of justice. The Bible promises those who hunger and thirst for that will ultimately be satisfied when the Lord rules again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then he talks about in verse 7, as we talk about our relationships with other people, the reward for mercy. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. A lot of people don't understand the difference between grace and mercy. Here's the difference. Grace is giving somebody what they don't deserve. Mercy is not giving people what they do deserve. Grace, giving people what they don't deserve, forgiveness. Mercy, not giving people what they do deserve, justice. You know people who run around all the time, I want justice, I want justice, I want justice. I want people to get what they deserve, but they sure don't want it for themselves. And I know, I'll be the first one to say, I do not want God to treat me with justice. I don't want God giving me what I deserve. I want grace. That's what mercy is. Mercy is not giving people what they deserve. You know, the Old Testament was based on justice. Leviticus 24, 19 to 21, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If you take somebody else's eye out, they get to take your eye out. If you knock somebody's tooth out, they knock your tooth out. Gandhi once said, the problem with an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is eventually everybody ends up blind and toothless. (laughs) That was never meant to sustain itself. Sometimes we need mercy. We need grace. When you refuse to give mercy and insist on justice, You're robbing yourself of the joy, the settled state that comes from forgiveness. You rob yourself of a blessing in this life, and you are in danger of robbing yourself of forgiveness in all eternity. Jesus said it very clearly in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Somebody once said, he who refuses to forgive destroys the bridge over which he must one day pass. Blessed, happy are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy. 